Thank you for joining me. I'm Sherry with Sunflowers and Petals, and today we will be discussing activism and change. If you enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe. I'm excited today to have a chance to chat with pro cyclist, author, filmmaker, and advocate, Catherine Bertin. Welcome, Catherine. Oh, hi, Sherry. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's awesome to have you. And congratulations on releasing your fourth book, Stand, a memoir of activism and a manual for progress. I can't help but notice this huge equal sign that takes up most of the cover. What does that symbolize? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, for me, it was really important that the message of, of activism and fighting for equality was the central image for the book, as opposed to cycling. There's a lot about cycling in the book, but it's, um, it's not a book about cycling. Okay. So, you know, I, for months and months, I thought about what I wanted to do for that cover image. And um, back in 2013, when I was racing at the World Championships, uh, and this was also during the heart of my advocacy for women's equal inclusion um, in racing, I, I went to the World Championships and during the sign-in stage, I held an equal sign over my head. And um, the UCI, which is the governing body of cycling, they didn't like that very much. And they fined me 50 euro. Wow. For, you know, and at the time, you know, I was like, are you kidding me? Really? So standing up for women's rights in a very silent, you know, public, um, but peaceful manner, holding up an equal sign, you know, that was enough to elicit a fine. Um, it, it equally made me uh, laugh, but also pissed off at that situation. I was very fortunate that um, a local photographer caught this image of that, you know, um. and, and um, sent me the photo. And in the back of my head, I said, you know, maybe someday there's a place where I can, can use this. So for the cover of the book, you just see my forearms holding up the right. equal sign because I also didn't want it to be, um, I didn't need my face on the cover. You know, it wasn't a book about me. It was a book about this journey, this mission of fighting for equal rights. So uh, that's where the cover of Stand originated. And I did put the full photo on the spine. It's like, <laughs> it's like a half an inch big, but at least you get the full reference, you know, of, of standing. Um, and I, of course, talk about it in the book. Uh, so that's part of the thing, part of the journey with the cover. I can also share with you that um, it was a deliberate choice on my behalf to make the cover blue. Uh, for me, it symbolized the fact that, and a lot of women writers face this, where art departments will try to um, quote unquote shrink it and pink it and make a book look feminine or you know pretty and just because you're a female author. And that didn't work for this theme for me, you know, and it, what really I wanted to do was um, re silently reclaim the color blue because women have a right to use blue just as much as men do pink. Right. And, you know, and I, so it was this kind of subtle way for me to, to challenge the industry, but not, um, not blatantly advertise it. So. <laughs> So that was, you know, that was, that was it. And this is what we ended up with. <laughs> I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. I give props to my dear art designer, Jennifer Vasco of 26.2 Designs made my vision in my head so much better than I ever would have imagined. And go figure, she's a triathlete. She's in the world of, of cycling in that regard. So. so she understands it. Yeah. She gets it. She yeah. gets it. So you mentioned in the book, you've endured harassment, bullying, and abandonment. Um, do you feel there's a double standard for when men advocate for change versus a woman? I do, and I wish I didn't feel that way. Um, but I think that women, you know, it, this, is, this is true in many regards. We're, we're always kind of up against uh, some type of, of stereotype or something, you know, it, no matter what it is we're fighting for or standing for. And then it gets compounded a little bit more, I think. It did for me anyway. This double standard reached across so many divides. Um, I would say that one of the hardest and most shocking to me was um, 
not that that guys were maybe not getting the message or the picture, but how many women actually didn't support the movement. Really? Uh, that well, I when I say so, you know, many. Um, let me rephrase that into two. <laughs> there were there were two in my universe at that point, working with ESPN and also um, on a professional racing team. And two of the women that I admired and looked up to, you know, in positions that were higher, much higher than mine, um, they didn't get it. Uh, and by it, I mean advocating for, for women's equality, for women's rights. Mm -hmm. So that made me very sad that, um, you know, for example, one, one, if not both, you know, when I started talking about equality and how cycling is great, but there's some things, sorry, my phone is going, is going off. Let me turn that off. <laughs> but what's really happening with that is that, you know, they, these women didn't want um, attention called to the negative side of, of the sport. And they felt that even though I do very much advocate how great and wonderful cycling is, as is, you know, all women's sports, it's a great thing. But if we don't call out the inequity, then we can't advance the sport. And their take was don't talk poorly about the sport at all, about any sport with women or we'll lose sponsors, we'll lose um, you know, investors. And to me, I knew in my gut, I said, I don't agree with that. I think if we lose investors or sponsors because they, are, you know, they don't want to be part of a sport, then good riddance to them. Let's find the sponsors and investors that actually say, I want to be part of making progress and change happen for the better for women. Agree. And yes. Yeah. It's, but it's, it's a scary message to get across because not everybody feels that way. So I did, I did find that that was, that was an issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go to Lacor uh, lacrosse. I'm, I'm sorry, lacrosse. La <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I do that too. I do that too. <laughs> And as you're doing that, I'm looking to turn off my phone so it doesn't beep at us again. Sorry about, about that. Okay. <laughs> so La Corse by Tour de France was held to this day. And what is the ripple effect you've seen um, from this change? The ripple effect is, I, for me, it's powerful to see this happening in two forms. Um, actually, three. Uh, first being that because we targeted the Tour de France, to, to have a women's race. Um, that trickle down theory then affected other races. Women's events were added to, you know, Vuelta España and to other events. We still need to do a lot of work in elongating the days and the number of events that are happening. But mm -hmm. um, people were looking and saying, oh, the Tour de France has La Course. What can we do to help advocate for change in our race? You know, so that was really helpful. The second part, is that a lot more women are now speaking up for change within, um, within professional cycling. Right. When I started talking about it, and this was back in 2012, 2013, those were the two big years where you know, we were making Half the Road, the documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, we were launching the petition on change.org. So um, in 2012 and 2013, I, not a lot of women were speaking out for two reasons. One, they were, very much afraid that they might lose their contract for, uh, you know, not being the smiling, happy, everything's great in cycling person. So they kept their mouth shut. And I can understand why that's a scary thing to, to consider losing a contract um, because you have an opinion, <laughs> you know? And then I, now I see it all over social media, uh, Twitter, especially where women who are in the sport at the higher levels will speak out and call things out, and that's fantastic. I'm also saying now that the media is more so on our side. Um, yes. They are reach, and you are part of this, you know, from, from podcast to national news, you know, more and more news programs are willing to say, hey, this isn't right. So now we've got the news pestering the Tour de France and the journalists speaking up and speaking out. And that's really incredibly helpful because we need it to be that teamwork element to make change happen, you know, and how, I mean, just think about how much more powerful it is if athletes and advocates and media are all on the same page right. pushing forward, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. 
Yeah, it's great. And you know, here we are seven, eight years later, gosh, hang on nine years, you know, since 2012 <laughs> and time flies. Um, yeah. You know, and I retired from the sport in 2017 and there are plenty of new pro athletes, you know, and that was just five years ago, but now there are all these new pro athletes. They have no idea who I, who I am, who I was, what I did. And I'm, I'm personally fine with that. My ego is fine with that. Um, but it's also, it's interesting to know that that's how much turnover and change can happen. Um, they know that LaCourse exists. They race at LaCourse. Uh, they don't know too much about the backstory of how that happened. That's another reason why I really wanted to write Stan to show how much goes in. Yes. to affecting change. And I don't need my name to be remembered, but I definitely want other women and minorities and awesome progressive men to say, okay, well, if that lady stood up and fought for change, then I can too. So great, that's great thing. message. Yeah. So I think the only sport where men and women compete on the same level in regards to distance um, and the women actually perform better in the longer distances is marathon swimming. Um, are there any cycling races where this is true? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say there is a potential for that. There are some areas like race across America, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, talk about an ultra distance event. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's pretty awesome. I know that there are women and women's teams who have proven how the uh, that female anatomy can actually truly have a huge advantage and benefit in distance racing but um there really are very few races that uh, in cycling that have that length and that distance however in what we did and this this data is is also in stand and it makes me very happy um we had a statistician, a statistician, Thorsten Rod, and he's in Germany, and he actually helped um, compile some data from races where men and women had the same race or the same event to try to prove that we have, the women's side has equal depth of field, equal talent to the men. Um, and usually the differential between um, a men's race and a women's race is a differential of about three miles an hour, which to the naked eye, to a spectator, that's nothing, you know? And the same thing is true in marathon running. Um, men are roughly about, in a, in a marathon, they're about 12 minutes faster than the, the women's winner and the men's winner are separated by about 12 minutes. But if you think about it, the women's winner also beats a lot of men <laughs> in the field. Maybe not the winner, but so many men. And that gap is actually narrowing, right? So it is proving that, um, that yeah, we are better, stronger, faster. But at the same time, it's not like we're out to, to race the men, to, to beat them, to prove a point. But it's the perfect way to include women saying like, look, right. we are not slow. We are not unable to do these distances. So wherever there's a, a men's race, there needs to be a women's equivalent. I totally agree. <laughs> so you've mentioned Half the Road, um, which you produced, um, and I watched it with several other cyclists and there were a lot of head shaking moments and like, did I hear that correctly? Um, the one rule that stood out to me was that women couldn't race when they had their period. Mm -hmm. And you could hear just like the eyes roll <laughs> in the audience when that came up. Um, are there any current or past UCI rules that just make you crazy? They all make me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we have a limited all... amount of time here. <laughs> right, I know. Like, how long do we have? Is this a six-hour <laughs> podcast? I'll just start right in. Um, no, the, the short answer is that um, some of these rules have been changed. And the, the rule that you refer to, uh, luckily, it never got instated. That was Inga Thompson, who raced very much throughout the 80s and the early 90s before she retired. And it was the head of the UCI who had said to her, hey, I'm thinking of instilling this rule about, you know, about women not being able to race when they're on their period. And it was Inga that stood up and said, absolutely not. 
That's insane. That's crazy. But to think that this mentality was back in the late 80s, early 90s, yes. that's not that long ago. That's a little frightening. Yes. Right? This is not 1880. We're talking about 1980. So this is, you know, scary stuff. Um, I think enough women banded together to, you know, to strike that down before it even made it to the rule level. But to think that the actual head of UCI was was talking about this with one of the top riders in the world is insane. Yeah, and you had to spend energy to try and keep it from becoming oh. a rule. It just, again, eye rolls and like, did I hear that right? <laughs> the eye rolls, exactly. Another one, and um, I'm happy to share some of these that did get changed. One was this ridiculous age median rule that this was still in effect in 2012. Um, and it was also part of the reason I was having such a hard time landing a pro contract. There was a rule that said, women's professional UCI teams cannot average over the age of 28. And not only did that not make any sense, it, it should be all always talent and merit based. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, what age you are, but also quite ironically, Kristen Armstrong had already won at that point her second gold medal in the Olympics in time trial. And she was in her mid thirties at that point. So she had two Olympic gold medalists. She would go on to win three, um, all within her 30s. You know, it's yeah. unreal that this, this rule was, was even there. Um, we Part of the reason that we included that in Half the Road was we wanted the film to be um, a benevolent embarrassment to the UCI. You know, we wanted them to take a look at this and be like, oh, oh, look at how the audience is reacting. Okay, maybe we should think about this. Yeah. And luckily in 2014, the age median rule was lifted. That's scrapped, it's gone. Um, I got my first pro contract at 37, you know, and, and I raced through 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, five years from 37 through 41. And my best career years, my best winningest year was at age 40 and 41. So, you know, again, further- Age further means nothing. Age means nothing, nothing, not, especially not in endurance sports, yes. you know? So, um, so those were, those rules made me cringe. And then we fought too, to have the base salary included at the world tour level. Men have a base salary, the world tour level, and women did not. That was also part of half the road. And we did a lot of lobbying behind the scenes and said, look, this is insane. This is crazy. Uh, it needs to be equal at the top. And sure enough, finally in 2020, they included women must have an, a base salary. Um, of course, UCI being um, delayed and a bit dinosaurish, they are taking three years to build that to full equity. So it started in 2020 and by 2023, it will be on equal tier with the men's base salary. Um, I believe that number is somewhere around 47,000 euro, it changes, it raises a little bit each year, or 40, okay. maybe the equivalent is $47,000. Um, and of, clearly many pro athletes are paid well above that, but at least knowing everybody is guaranteed a base wage is, is a very big deal, especially when it comes to equity. Yep, absolutely. So how can the next generation of female athletes engage in continuing to advocate for equality at both the professional and the collegiate level? And where do they even begin? Yeah, great question. Um, I certainly know when I was in, in my 20s, I don't think I ever even questioned equality. I thought, oh, it's, you know, it's 2021. Everything is equal these days, you know? And I, I didn't know at the time that we really have to peel back the layers and dig a little deeper and ask that question. Well, wait, are things really equal? Um, so for me, that became apparent um, as I got older. I'm now 45 uh, and I can look back and say, if I were just getting into this sport in my early twenties or even as a teen, equality would never have been on the forefront of my thoughts whatsoever. So what I would love for the younger athletes coming up the ranks um, when they find themselves in a situation where something doesn't make sense or doesn't feel right, or they say, oh, why is this race, why is our race 50 miles when the men race 100 miles? You know, I, I ask them to challenge that, um, not complain, but actually challenge it 
by going to the powers that be and saying, hey, look, this isn't right. This is old, this is outdated. We need to fix this. I also advocate not just for young people, but for all people that wanna create change. The best way to do that is to form a group, um, to form a team. And the way that we made that happen for La Course at, um, at the Tour de France was there were four of us that came together, all sharing the same idea. Yes, of course, women should have access to this race. Um, that is really where, where the party started, you know, because um, I got together with three of the biggest names in cycling and triathlon at that time in 2012, 2013. That was Emma Pooley, Marianne Voss, Chrissy Wellington. These women were multiple time world champions and or Olympic gold medalists. And then there's me. I have none of those Palmars. I, I did well in racing. I've got some wins. I'm okay. But I didn't have that world championship status. They did. They were superstars. But I knew if I could get us together and organize properly and also, you know, back our mission and our thoughts in a proper way with a, you know, a website, a manifesto, a purpose of where we were going and what we were doing, that that would strengthen our cause. So, I'm hoping very much that that serves as an example that um, we all have the power to create change. You don't have to be a mega superstar. You know, somebody's got to drive the bus of progress and we're all capable of being the bus driver. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's something that I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that um, people will know that when you, when you have a vision, if you can reach out and connect with other people who share that vision, right. you can you can do some really terrific damage. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and I certainly hope that young people know that, um, again, age doesn't matter. When you want to affect change, you can do that at any age. Yep. And, and I think we saw that in 2020, a lot of oh, yeah. people born, mm -hmm. which was great to see. It was so great. It was so great to see. And young people need to know that they matter and they, their voice counts just as much. Yes. You know, maybe if not more so, because they are considered the future, right? So it's so important. And also young people reach out to the older people <laughs> for some guidance and some help along the way. And really um, that can also benefit your cause by getting different demographics and age groups involved. Good, good information and absolutely great tips. So um, we talked earlier about the inequity in salaries and in 2017, you founded Homestretch Foundation in Tucson. Um, tell us a little bit about the foundation and your fight for base salaries for pro cyclists. Yeah, so the Homestretch Foundation really began as many things do, you know, under the uh, necessity is the mother of invention kind of, you know, clause. Because when I was racing for those five years professionally, only one of those five years did I make a salary that was above the poverty line. So I always had to carry a second, if not a third job, you know, just to make it um, and to squeak by. And I'm all for paying your dues in sport. Yes, we all have to do that. We, we all have to climb the ranks of talent. And that's fine. That's great. Makes sense. But when you get to the top, if things aren't equal there, then something's wrong. So, you know, back in 2015, um, I was going through all sorts of, of life changes too. I was, um, I was in a divorce situation. I was trying to keep racing professionally. If I had, ha and I was on a world tour team, but I didn't have a base salary. And had I had a base salary, I really would have been okay. I would have been able to muddle through, but because I didn't, I had to take on these extra jobs. And I kept thinking to myself, this isn't fair. This isn't right. We've got to switch this. Uh, because if I had been a man going through the same life situations that I was going through, um, it would have, I would have been fine. You know, I, I, I would have had an actual dependable income. I would have been able to muddle through, but because I was a woman that wasn't there. And I thought, okay, what if, what if there were a place where other female pro athletes, um, mostly in cycling, but any sport really, if they're struggling with the wage gap and they're faced with the choice of having to quit because they can't, they can't make ends meet, um, then what if there were a place where they could go and train, live and train for free, and behind the scenes, we fight 
for that uh, that pay gap discrepancy to go away because we didn't want to be a band aid situation. You know, so mm -hmm. I remember thinking, man, if I had a place like that in 2015, I I would have had a much easier, better time. And, um, you know, and I would have felt valued on so many levels to, you know, to just be able to make it. So, um, so I put this plan into play of what if, what if we could create a residence with exactly that meaning and that purpose and work behind the scenes to change the, the, the base wage. And sure enough, um, I didn't think that that dream would come together as quickly as it did, but I was able to find an investor, a business partner who said, you know what, let's do this. I believe in this. Wow. Yeah. And the guy that I partnered up with to make this foundation happen, he's, you know, kind of a recreational cyclist, but he has a son and a daughter. And what was in it for him was like, I, you know, neither of his kids are cyclists. But he said, I just can't imagine a world where my children are treated differently because of their gender. And for him, that's what flipped the switch in terms of creating Homestretch and making it a reality. So here we are, Tucson, Arizona. We just started our fifth year at Homestretch. We have helped over 70 athletes from 17 different nations. Wow. Who have come through our doors. That's fantastic. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, it feels good. And then the big win, of course, was getting the base salary allocation in 2020. So there are still athletes that um, need our assistance because they're not yet at the world tour level, but uh -huh. it makes us very happy that at least those athletes up there at the top are going to be okay now. Yeah, I just remember some scenes from Half the Road where you had to crash on someone's couch. You couldn't even <laughs> afford a hotel room. You know, yeah. it just... Exactly. And then you got to get up in the morning and perform. You know, it's just crazy. Right. And those are, I, I think those are actually healthy situations when you're first navigating your way through the amateur ranks of sport yeah. to know how much it takes to get into it and to get like, that was very character building, but yeah. no way should that be the conditions that, that the world-class top level of professional athletes have to look for a borrowed bed or couch. Right. Right. So, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I just couldn't imagine sleeping on a couch and then getting up and performing well the next morning. And no, that's, I think that's where the, um, that, that athlete, uh, competitor denial system kicks in, you yeah. know, and you just have to think like, no, no, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm all right. I can do this. You know, and that only lasts so long before you're just completely tired from the entire ordeal. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Well, thank you, Catherine, for joining me today. If someone wants to purchase your book, um, where can they find it? Oh, uh, thank you for asking. So Stand is now available worldwide. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can also go to your local bookstore. If they don't have it in stock, they'll order it for you. And I love that format uh, because then you can support local as much as you want, or you can have the ease of Amazon and Barnes & Noble deliver. Um, also, you can hop on my mailing list at katherinebertine.com if you want to stay updated with uh, whatever projects I'm involved with. But um, we're really excited about the book coming out. And um, honestly, I am honored and grateful and thankful if you pick up a copy because it's proving to the publishing industry that books about women who stand up and fight for change matter and make a difference. And the more that we can get books like mine out there, and that's a, uh, that's a shelf that needs to be well stocked in bookstores, I think. And you also self-publish. And it's interesting that I interviewed mm -hmm. another author earlier in the week who also self-published. She wrote a book, If You Give a Girl a Bike. It's a uh, children's book. Yes. So why did you choose self-publishing? Oh, I would say that in this case, it was the only route to go. So the Stand is my fourth book. And the first three books were all published by traditional companies where they give you a book advance, you write the book and you deliver the manuscript and then, um, you know, magic elves and fairies put it out onto the shelves. You know, that's, that's the world of traditional publishing. Um, this time, when my agent shot the book proposal for Stand to the corporate market, all of them, well, 25 major publishers, they all turned it down for the same reason. And they would start out by saying, well, yeah, Bertine's a good writer, but a, a book about women who stand up and fight for change, it's not going to sell. It's not marketable. Don't bother. 
And then my favorite, there's no room on the shelf. And I, my agent and I were like, this is nuts. You yeah. know, especially if I've already quote unquote proven myself as a writer, you know, after the first three books, the fact that it was the sense of the topic that it wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference. And they, you know, for them to say, don't even bother writing it. Well, that of course spurred my inner activist to be like, oh no, don't oh, tell we me are no. writing it. <laughs> right? So yeah. I had my only two choices were either don't write the book or write it and, and self-publish it and put it out there yourself. So I decided, I'm like, I'm going to do the latter, but it took me three years because I then, much like the, the journey through cycling, I had to work other jobs to, and write this book around that timetable because uh, I didn't have a book advance for this where I could prioritize, oh, right. right? So I, I had to do other life things to pay all the bills. And um, so that's why I stand, it's meaningful that it's out here. It's come out, you know, three years, it's taken three years, but um, it's also proving corporate publishing wrong because we have had a tremendous week of sales awesome. this week, you know, for, really, for it's been successful. Yeah. It's, well, I'm thrilled about that makes me happy. I certainly know as an author that, um, it, you know, we don't make a, a huge living off of writing books, you it's know, a it's, passion. it's a passion, it's yeah. a passion, but for me, I would love this book to do well to kind of stick it to the man of corporate publishing. Like, how dare you say that women and minorities who fight for change don't matter? We're going to prove you wrong. Everybody's story matters when it comes to creating change. You can do I told you so dance for them. Oh, know? I, I, every time I feel kind of bummed out or low, you know, I start up that uh, told you so dance when yeah. I see, you know, a kind review or a or a post or a share, you know, where somebody's actually getting something out of this book, it makes me really happy. Great. Well, I wish you much success with the book and I thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank and, you, Terry. And thanks for watching another Sunflowers and Petals video. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button below and make sure you subscribe and enjoy the ride.